Today is the retiree Sunday, the fourth Sunday of uh, May. The epistle for this fourth Sunday of Lent, the Dari Sunday, is taken from St. Paul's fourth chapter of Galatians, to the letter of Galatians, chapter 4. Brethren, it is written that Abraham had two sons. One by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. So St. Joseph said by another word, For these are the two testaments, the one from Mount Sinai, engendering unto bondage, which is Agar. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, which hath affinity to that Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But that Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice thou that barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that prevailest not, for many are the children of the desolate, more than of her that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born according to the flesh persecuted him that was after the spirit, so also it is now. But what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. By the freedom of which Christ hath made us free. In the gospel. In the word of John, in John chapter 6. At that time, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. He is therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the past, the festival day of the Jews was near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes, and seeing that a very great multitude cometh to him, he said to Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to try him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, saying, and saying, Two hundred and a penny worth of bread is not enough. It is not sufficient for them that every one may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here that hath five barley loaves and two fishes. What are these among so many? Then he just said, Make the men to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. The men therefore sat down in a number of about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down. In like manner also of the fishes, as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up therefore and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, This is of truth, the prophet that is to come into the world. He is therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, but again to the mountain, himself alone. Let's put the words of today's holy gospel. When we follow the Lord, let's amen. Today is the Tari Sunday. It's a Sunday of rejoicing. We're over the halfway point of the season of Lent. It is a day in which we read the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. In a mysterious day in the life of our Lord. And when our Lord went into the, across the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd followed him across the Sea of Galilee. And they followed him, and the Gospel tells us why. They followed him because they saw the miracles that he did, and how he cured all those who were diseased. So they followed him out into the desert. And he was there for some time, and they had forgotten to bring food, and there was time after his long sermon and talked to them and catechisms and so on, for them to return home. But then our Lord turned to St. Philip, 
and the apostles and went to all the apostles and said that the, the, the we should feed them lest they go away fasting and faint in the way. And Philip said, there's a man here that's two barley loaves, boy here has two barley loaves and, 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 and fishes, five barley loaves and two fishes, and what are these among so many? And then our Lord says, but our Lord said these things to test him, for he knew what he would do. When God created the world, he created it absolutely perfect, but he made it out of nothing. And the challenge of making the world out of nothing is if God does not continually hold up the atoms and hold up the molecules, hold up the sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth, and the plants, the animals, the human beings, the angels, and all things living and non living, then they will fall back into their natural state. So that when, when a, a carpenter comes to wood and he sees wood, he takes the wood that was there before he visited it, he shapes the wood and it becomes a chair. He gets an extra wood and he shapes it and it becomes a table. And then he leaves. And the shape that he created remains. Why does it remain? Because the wood was not from him. And the nails were not from him. And the glue was not from him. All he did was shape it. Therefore, the carpenter can leave. He can walk away and then the table stands on its own. However, when God created this world, he made it ex nihilo. He made everything in it out of nothing. Therefore, if God walks away, then what happens? Just like the carpenter when he walks away from the table, it reverts to what it is, which is wood and glue and nails. And it remains wood and glue and nails, and the table lasts. It lasts because it's made of something that was not from the carpenter. However, when God created the world made out of nothing, and if he walks away, it returns to what it was made out of, just like everything else. And it's made of nothing. So if God walks away from a man, the man ceases to exist. And as it says in the psalm, God looks upon the deer, and he dances through the forest. He skips through the forest. God turns his face away, and the deer collapses and dies. So there are two actions of God. One is the act by which he creates. And he did this 6,000 years ago at the beginning of time. And the act of creation stopped after the six days of God creating every kind of creature that there is. But then his second work is to sustain, to preserve, to maintain that which he created. And this maintenance he does from the time that the creation stopped until the very end of the world. And how does he do it? He does it by his eyes watching over us and over all things by divine providence. With his loving care, he watches over everything he created. And he watched over it from the beginning, once it was created, until the very end of the world. Some things will cease to exist after they die. As dogs, when they die, they cease to exist. Plants cease to exist when they die. The matter returns back into the, into the rest of the universe. It does not it does not cease, but nonetheless, the being itself ceases. And God created all things, and He maintains them by His divine providence. Now, as things continue stably throughout time, we sometimes forget this. We forget that God maintains things by His divine providence. And therefore, God allowed there to be certain struggles amongst men. You don't find these struggles amongst the other creatures. There's no crisis amongst dogs. There's never a crisis amongst dogs. There's no crisis amongst any of the animals. Animals are always reliable, always consistent, and they don't have crises. They're always good, they're always the same. They will never change. They don't have crises. But God allows there to be crises in the human life because we have something called free will. We have something called the mind, and we can choose to deny God, and we can choose to follow God, we can choose to believe in God and His providence, and we can choose to reject God and His providence. Therefore, God allows there to be struggles from time to time in order to test us. Do you believe in my divine providence? He even asks questions. 
So as he says to the apostles, he says, so what are we going to do? Because there are 5,000 men here, and women and children, there's 20,000, and these 20,000 are going to go away. They're going to go back home without having eaten for a day or more, so more than a day, maybe a couple days or three days, and they need some food. What should we do lest they faint in the way? And then Philip says, there is a boy here that has five barley loaves and two fishes. But the scripture makes it very clear, and Christ very clear, he knew what he would do. And there are many, many times which Christ will ask us questions. Whom do you say that I am? Whom do men say that the Messiah is? He asks these questions to St. Peter and to all the apostles. And so therefore he asks many questions. But he does not ask questions because he does not know the answers. He asks questions, our Lord asks questions in order to test us. Do we know the answer? Do we remember the answer? Do we know what is going to happen? And so there will be times in which there shall be tests to see if we believe in divine providence. For he knew what he would do. Now many people came across that day. And it's interesting, he's teaching his apostles what he's doing. He's teaching his twelve apostles, and eleven of them are going to learn. And one of them is going to become a traitor on this day. There's going to be a transition that happens on this day. And so very often we don't realize the day of the test is not the day that we think it is. Maybe today is the day of a test, the day of a little coronavirus going on right now. Maybe it's a day of a little litmus test for us Catholics. Do you I love your faith? Are you ready to die for your faith? Are you ready to do what it takes to live according to your faith? Because we all know that in America, for instance, we know that we're a free country, there's freedom in our country, and you can never experience the government saying that you can't go to church. This can't happen in America. Well, today is the 22nd of March, 2020, and many people are afraid to go to church. Why are they afraid to go to church? Because something bad might happen to them. And they're locked down in many places. We are told one of the so one of the works of mercy, today is the day to practice one of these works of mercy, equals to visit the sick. The sick cannot be visited today. In many hospitals throughout the world, throughout the United States, and throughout the world. Donald Trump announced a couple of days yesterday. He said, we're very proud to announce that 148 countries are working in complete unison as much as possible, working together to fight this great virus. There's lockdowns in 148 countries. We're pleased to announce. The police, the National Guard, the soldiers, they're all coming out to ensure that everyone is healthy. And health doesn't involve God. And health doesn't involve going to heaven. And health doesn't involve sanctifying grace. And health doesn't involve faith. And health doesn't involve freedom. You see, the new God is the state. And the state knows what's best for you. And so there is a task. You must be good citizens. You must be good people of the global earth by practicing social distancing. You have to be socially distant in order to be socially responsible. Does that sound like the gospel? Does that sound like our Lord Jesus Christ? Does that sound like the teaching of the saints? You must be socially responsible by being socially distant. And if you find people gathering together, don't forget to report it. There's nothing illegal now, this is just a test to see how cooperative the people are. This is only a test. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ said to Philip, we have a problem here. There is no food. They are going away fasting. What should we do? Now, let us consider the minds and hearts of those apostles in this two-day journey. 
They are traveling with the Lord Jesus Christ across the Sea of Galilee, as they have done many times. But imagine the number of boats that had to cross that sea. Every boat was constricted, and so many thousands of people got in those boats. And they went across the Sea of Galilee to the land of Tiberias. And some, of course, were already on that side. And they went to Tiberias, and they went across the sea, and there were 5,000 men and 20,000 people that followed Christ in the desert. He didn't ask them to come. They came. Isn't this wonderful? This is a sign of a mass conversion. We're starting to have effects here. Look at what's happening. People are coming back to the Latin Mass everywhere in the world. We're seeing young priests celebrating the Mass. We're seeing people come back to church. We're seeing religion increase. Yes, there are still bad things in the world, but look at what's happening. People are responding. They're coming to the truth. Here we are walking the desert, and there are 12 apostles of Christ, and one of the most excited apostles was the man from Galilee, or rather from Judea. The man from Judea. There were only two from Judea. One was our Lord Jesus Christ, and the other one was Judas from Cariot. And Judas and Cariot was extremely happy. He said, this is great. Finally, we're accomplishing something. Here we are walking out into the desert, and we're with our Lord, and I'm going to always be faithful to him, and we're together, and there are 5,000 men following us. We didn't command them to follow us. They saw the miracles. They saw him to take care of those that were diseased. We've got 20,000 people in the desert. Imagine what we can do in the cities. We perform lots of miracles in Capernaum, which is this hometown of St. Peter. But why can't we go somewhere else and perform miracles also? This is great. The people believe and they come. And now they're in the desert and Christ multiplies the loaves. What a great miracle. What a great miracle. We forget about the hearts of men. What is the heart of man really like? It says in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, And the people believed in him. This is a few chapters before chapter 6. And the people believed in him, and they believed in him because of his miracles. They believed in him because of his beautiful teaching. They believed in him. They thought he was wonderful. But he put not his trust in them, for he knew what was in the heart of man. That's what the Holy Ghost inspired St. John to write. But he, our Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity, did not put his trust in them because he knew what was in the heart of man. But the apostles didn't know. St. John didn't know. And now they're going to see what is in the heart of man. It's time for them to see the mystery of what is in the heart of man. Our Lord Jesus Christ multiplies the loaves of the 5,000, and he feeds them. That's what's in the gospel today. And then we have the strange behavior of Christ, the scandalous behavior of Christ, and the beginning of the fulfillment of a prophecy that was made by Simeon when he was only 40 days old. You can't say it wasn't predicted to be a problem. Because when he was 40 days old, this child went into the, into the temple, and an old wise man said, This child shall be for the fall of many. That's what he said. This child shall be for the rise and the fall of many. He shall be the rise of many, and he shall be the fall of many. There will be many who will fall because of this child. He shall be a sign of contradiction. And the soul of his own mother shall be pierced by a sword, and thy own soul also shall be pierced by a sword. This child shall be the cause of the fall of many in Israel. Did he change? When he was 30 years old, he said, Blessed is he that is not scandalized in me. And when he died and rose from the dead, St. Paul said he was a scandal. He was predicted to be a scandal when he was a child, 40 days old. He said he was a scandal when he was 30. And even after he died and rose from the dead, St. Paul assures us that he was a stumbling block. He is a scandal to the Jews. He is a scandal. He didn't change much. God never does. 
But on this day, Judas is very happy. And as noted by the evangelist, the saints pointed out, it is in John chapter 6, at the end of the chapter, that long chapter, where, where St. John the Apostle says, and Judas the traitor was there. Of course he was there, because he was always there. He was one of the twelve apostles. But St. John makes a special mention that Judas the traitor was there, because on this day, he stopped being an apostle. There were twelve apostles in the morning. There were twelve apostles barely at night. But the next morning, when Christ came back down the mountain, there were eleven apostles. And the twelfth apostle had shut God out of his heart. The twelfth apostle was scandalized, and the twelfth apostle fell. And the twelfth apostle didn't believe anymore, because Christ is doing things wrong. He's not doing things the way that work. We know what works. It was Judas that inspired the Catholic Church in 1962 to 1965 for the spirit of Vatican II. And what is that spirit? It is the spirit of Judas. That was the spirit of those bishops that gathered in Vatican II. And what was their spirit? Forget specifically about all the heresies, the ecumenism and the modernism. What was the spirit behind those bishops and what did they say they were going to do? We are going to have a council that's going to fit the modern world. We're going to have a council that's going to give people what they want. That's going to tell people what they want to hear. That's going to adapt the church to the people. And when the church is adapted to the people, imagine the countless conversions. There's going to be a massive increase. And you know what there was? There was? It was interesting when Bishop Williamson and I, in 2005, went around and looked for seminaries. It cost less than $50 million. To replace St. Thomas Aquinas Seminary in Minnesota, I was tasked with a job to look for another seminary that was bigger, and I visited 105 different places. Bishop Williamson came from South America, and then myself, Bishop Williamson, a couple of the faithful went around, and we visited 105 seminaries, and all within 200 miles radius of New York City in the Northeast, in order to find a place that would be bigger than Monona, we found we found five places, beautiful places that could be used and purchased, but they would they would cost too much money because it would be around five million dollars to get all of them. So to save money, they spent fifty million dollars on the new place. But the fact is, we went to find the seminary, and it was interesting that we learned just the history of the late 60s and early 70s, and so we didn't know. Visiting all these places, they were all booming in 1967 and 1968. Some of them were built in the 1967 and 68. Some of them had new construction projects going on in 1968. Because there's been a new council, the council is causing massive conversions, and everybody's going to be priests, and everybody's going to be brothers, and everybody's going to be monks, and everybody's going to be nuns, and there's going to be a massive conversion. By 1972, 90% of the places we visited were closed. Within four years, the boom turned into a bust. Because after all, after the council, the church is going to be better. And Judas knew it was going to be better if only Jesus Christ would have listened to Judas. And if only the Holy Ghost would have visited those Judases who created Vatican II. If only he would have visited them, surely there would have been a great blessing after the council. Forget about the heresies. The spirit of the council was the spirit of Judas that wanted to make the church fit the world and make the world church pleasing to the world. And if the church is pleasing to the world and he's not some whole cold priest wearing a cassock called Father X and Father Y by his last name, but rather, he's going to be Father Bob or Father Tim. Now what about the religious priests? We always called them by their first names. Father Raphael and Father Cyprian and so on. No, we're not going to call them by their first names because they have changed their names to the names of the saints. We're going to call them by their original baptismal names. And we're going to make them like the rest of the world. And it's going to be so wonderful but what happened? The last words of the gospel today 
are wearing what really happened. There was a great miracle. And here are the beautiful words of the followers of Jesus Christ. Now what a miracle. And then the five barley loaves, they gathered up therefore and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, those five thousand men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, This is of a truth, the prophet that is coming to the world. That's Catholic dogma. That's the truth. Isn't that wonderful? This is of a truth, the prophet that is coming to the world. Is the truth totally deadly to the devil? Does it terrify him when I say the truth? Does it terrify him when you say the truth? Does it terrify him when people in the world say the truth? Apparently not. These 5,000 spoke the truth. Indeed, he is the prophet that's coming to the world. And then what do they do? They have their human plans. And then Jesus, therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force, and make him king, fled again to the mountain, ipse solus, himself alone. It's a mysterious day. The eleven apostles are getting the headache. Eleven apostles don't understand, and one apostle is scandalized, and one apostle is headache, and one apostle says, this is enough. This man needs to be eradicated. He needs to be eliminated. Here is his chance. Take 5,000 men in the desert, go back into the city, gather 20,000, gather 100,000, drive out the Romans, perform these miracles, spread the faith throughout the whole world, and they will all become Catholics, and they will all follow Jesus, and they will all believe, and they will all be wonderful. And what is he doing? He went into the mountain himself alone. Where is he? And Christ went into a mountain, ipse solus. And eleven apostles don't understand. They don't understand. They can't understand. The next day, Christ comes down the mountain. And then he gives a sermon. And all twelve have hope. Now he's going to say, You were you going to force me to be king? No, I become king on my own circumstances. Today I'll gather you up. But what did he do? He came down the mountain and he said, Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. And they became scandalized. These are the 5,000. Remember the crowd that we're talking about here. This is not a crowd of pagans. This is not a crowd of Pharisees and Sadducees. There are no Pharisees and Sadducees in the crowd. This is not, this is the crowd of the faithful. This is the crowd of the ones that believe. This is the crowd of the Catholics. This is the crowd of the good people. And he comes out and tells them, you must eat my flesh, you must drink my blood, and you can't eat my flesh when I'm alive, therefore I must die. You must drink my blood. You must recognize that I became man to die on the cross for sin. I became man to eradicate sin, and you are not, you have to eradicate your own sin, and believing the truth is a beautiful thing. But that truth is not true if it doesn't go down into your guts. That truth isn't true if it doesn't come out of your hands, if it doesn't come out of your feet, if it doesn't come out of your actions. Is it true? The truth by itself does not scare the devil. It must be truth spoken with life. Because our truth is alive. Our words to Christ is one. And he said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. What does that mean? The truth must be on a path. And the truth must be alive. And when the truth is on a path, moving, and when the truth is alive, that is Jesus Christ. Now where is this path leading? It is leading only to God the Father. It is inspired only by the Holy Ghost, and it is Christ who is walking. Now this is the way, and what is life?
the incline of the Holy Ghost, that that truth be inside of our blood and that it come out of our mouths and come out of our hearts and come out of all things. This truth must be alive. This truth must be away. And these, these people believe in the truth because it was a nice thing to know and a nice thing to understand between breakfast and lunch. But there had better be a good breakfast and there had better be a good lunch. And what our Lord Jesus Christ say to them, and this is very important for the apostles to hear, you believed in me yesterday. No, you did not believe in me yesterday. You wanted to make me king yesterday. You didn't want me to be king. The only reason you believed in me yesterday, the only reason you want to make me a king yesterday is because of the bread. You don't love God. You don't love Christ. You don't love the truth. You love the bread. Give me the bread. You love the bread. You don't love the truth. Now the fact is, we are not made to love bread. We are made to love God. So every now and then he gives a test. And he even shows us, God made us to eat bread. We have to pay taxes once in a while. Pull some rupees out of the fish. We have to live in this world. And our Lord himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, the Heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all other things shall be added unto you besides. But do you seek first the kingdom of God and his justice? We all say we do. Because justice demands we get a good paycheck. And justice demands that we get a nice house. And justice demands that we be properly taken care of. And we believe in the kingdom of God and his justice. And justice demands that all our enemies get work. We believe in that. Is that Christ's justice? No, it's not. That's my justice. What justice do you believe in? Notice what he said. The kingdom of God and his justice. That's what he said. Do we believe in the kingdom of God and his justice? Apparently not. So every now and then he gives a test. And what happened on that day? Today, 20,000 happy people. Tomorrow, they all leave. Not everyone, but more than 99%. They went away disgusted. And they would not recover from that disgust. Judas did not leave for the same reason that the others did leave. Judas did not leave because he was one of the twelve. He wanted to leave, but he couldn't. He was like the charity of the builders. The builders were terrified of St. Francis Cabrini in Colorado. They were building an orphanage on top of the mountain in Denver, where she'd have the miraculous water come out a little bit later. And they would send her a bill, and she wrote on the bill, Deo Gracias, and send the bill back. And he said, you got to pay. They all got this and sent the bill back. And the contractors got together and said, that's it, I'm quitting. You, I'm quitting. I'm quitting. I'm quitting. I'm quitting. I'm, quitting. I'm not going to work tomorrow. But she showed up to do this. And they did it. Everybody was going to quit. Nobody did. Because they were terrified to be the first one to quit. So nobody quit. They were not happy. But they worked. They were terrified to be the first one to quit. So no one quit. And they built the whole thing. And at the end, finally, the head contractor said, You see, you still can't have your orphans on top of this mountain because there's no water here. You can't bring the boys up on top of the mountain, the girls up on top of the mountain. There's no water here. And you want water? Here it is. Took a staff like Moses, she hit a rock in Denver, Colorado. And water came out of the rock. And it's still coming out of that rock to this day. And there's water in the mountains. God will provide what he wants. Were they virtuous workers? No, they were not. Did they see the work to the end? Oh, yes, they did. Was God pleased with them? Absolutely not. Did the job get done? Yes, it did. Did they go to heaven for it? No. So likewise, Judas, he stayed with the other 11 apostles. He wanted to leave and teach Jesus Christ a lesson. But he couldn't do it because... He was 
one of the twelve. His heart was one of the mob. His heart was one of the crowd. His heart was with them. He was disgusted like them. He wanted to show signs of disgust, but he couldn't do it because he had bewildered apostles on his hands, and he thought it would work on them. But they were hopeless. They all wandered away. And those apostles that were so happy the day before became so very sad and so very sorrowful, and they didn't understand. And they were worried, and they were wandering about, and Judas wanted to go. And he was trying to motivate the others to leave as well. But he wasn't the one in charge. Only St. Peter could do that, and he couldn't do it. Then Christ turned to the twelve apostles and said, Will you leave me also? He was not speaking to Judas, because Judas already left. He was <coughs> asking a question to eleven men. They thought twelve were getting the question, but only eleven were getting the question. Will you leave me also? And then St. Peter, the great St. Peter, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? And all the pain that was in the Sacred Heart. All the pain that was in it, because those people came for bread, because they didn't love him when they should have, and the agony that caused his heart was healed by the words of Simon Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? Sometimes, when we don't know all the answers, we don't know where to go, but we do know we can't leave him. We don't know what to do, but we do know that if you sleep in a boat, wake him up. And we don't know if it's safe to go out in a storm, but if he's out in the water, jump into it. And that's the wisdom of Simon Peter. And we don't know if we can be forgiven for denying Christ three times, but we run to the tomb to see if he's there. Simon Peter always knew what to do. He wasn't smart like St. John. He didn't know all the answers, but he knew the essential answer. Go to Christ in every circumstance. Don't go anywhere else. And in the end, you'll be happy. In the end, you'll be able to conquer all the enemies of God. In the end, you'll be wise. In the end, many beautiful things will happen. Just don't go anywhere else. And Simon Peter had one of his great days when he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou alone hast the words of eternal life. I want eternal life. I don't understand why they all left. I don't know what this eat my flesh, drink my blood means. I don't understand it at all. But I know that I'm going to believe what you're saying. And I know I'm going to follow wherever you go. And I know that your miracles prove that you are God. Your miracles prove that you are the truth. And even if I don't understand it, it's because of the weakness of my mind. It's because I don't understand things well anyway. It's not because it's not true. It's because of the weakness in my mind. Not the weakness of God. Not the contradiction of God. He knows what he's doing. And sometimes he tests, for he always knows what he is going to do. And whenever we decide to follow the ways of the world, it's a disaster. It's not going to work. It's not what God wants. So let's ask the grace to imitate the great Simon Peter. Not go into the trap of the most wicked Judas. And all those Judases whose spirit created the errors and heresies of Vatican II. Their errors and heresies met counsel. But they came from the wicked spirit of Jews of Judas bishops who wanted to be like unto the world. They wanted to be like the world without, without heresy, but you couldn't have it, so they had to accept a few small heresies. They wanted to be without, with the world without changing their religion, but they had to make some minor modifications. Because it was more important to be like unto the world than it was to be like unto Christ. Therefore, they have the spirit of Judas. It was more important to have the things of the world than have the things of Christ. And hence, they are thieves, like Judas was a thief. And they are traitors, as Judas was a traitor. But we must have, in the time of trouble, the spirit of Simon Peter. Lord, thou alone hast the word of eternal life. 
To whom shall we go? There's no other place to go. Let us stay with thee all the way to the end. Let us you all in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost.